Well, good morning. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church this morning. I'm happy to see you all here. I'm glad that y'all show up for congregational meetings and things like that. You know, half of y'all been gone the whole year, but I'm glad you're here today. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding, sort of. Uh, a couple of quick announcements on the back of your bulletin. Uh, tonight, we will do our Vespers. Um, you know, unfortunately, we've had some different things canceled due to COVID, but we'll still just go ahead and continue on with Vespers tonight in its place. Um, and Mark Everett will have the elementary youth as well. Uh, we're still doing uh, the Christmas offering for the P uh, PCA Ministerial Relief. You should have a handout and an envelope in your bulletin. So if you're wanting to gift to that, that is still, we're still taking that up today. So you can place that in the offering plate on your way out, um, or you can give it to a deacon and they can uh, take it for you. So please be aware of that. We're still doing that as well today. Uh, also, we have called a congregational meeting today immediately after church. We'll have a short uh, postlude and allow me to get changed out of this robe, and then we'll come back and we will uh, discuss the budgets. We'll vote on the budgets and also uh, the new church officers, which you should have uh, ballots will be handed out to you after church. Wonderful. Is there anything else that I may have missed? We do have the uh, Lessons and Carols coming up on the 13th, uh, which will be great. December 13th, Lessons and Carols. Um, and then our missions conference coming up in March. Is there anything else? All right. Stand with me, if you will, for your call to worship. Hear God's call and respond accordingly. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Let us bless our God. Let the sound of his praise be heard from our lips. Amen. Let's now sing to the Lord hymn number 196, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our great God and King, we come into your house this morning to worship you, to praise you, to sit in awe and wonder of the great works that you have done. Lord, we're just saying that Jesus has come to reign in us forever, to come and to redeem his people, and the Lord Jesus has done that. We gather this morning on the second week of Advent to remember his coming for us, but we also look forward to the coming again that he brings. Lord, we believe that we were set free from bondage and sin and set free for the purpose to serve and to worship you. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us now to worship in spirit and in truth. Help us now as we pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christians have confessed the same fundamental truth for centuries now, and we get an opportunity to recite those truths together, not only here with us in the congregation, but also with those of all ages. So I ask you, Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Just as every week we recite the Apostles' Creed together, we also corporately confess our sins to the Lord. Why do we do this? Well, we do it for a couple of reasons, but the main reason is because God's people have always confessed their sins together. You can look all through the Old Testament and even in the New, God's congregation has always confessed their sins. And we do this because we know the promise that God has given us that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And so it's a wonderful thing to come into God's house and to confess your sins corporately putting everyone on an equal playing field, but also hearing the words of sweet assurance that the gospel offers us. So I invite you now to join me in this corporate confession. Lord God, in this season, we are reminded that you became flesh and dwelt among humanity with perfect love for God and perfect love for neighbor. You entered into this world and the lives of others to bring light and life. We confess that we have neglected God and failed to love others. We repent of these sins and come in confidence that you will forgive us and change us. Let's silently confess our sins before the Lord. Thank <laughs> you. 
People of First Presbyterian, lift up your eyes and hear God's word of assurance to you this morning. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. May the God of mercy, who forgives us all of our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let's stand and sing in response. Hymn number 193, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence. 193. be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer once again. Our Lord and our God, we just sang before you that all mortal flesh keeps silence with fear and trembling stand and to ponder nothing earthly minded. Lord, we confess that it is hard to do that. It is hard to turn our eyes away from the things of this earth and onto you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would, by your Holy Spirit, turn our eyes from worthless things, cause us to stand in awe and fear of you, a proper fear, 
a reverent fear, one that acknowledges that you are a holy God, that six-winged seraph surrounds your throne even now. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for the safety and health of our community. We pray that you would give our leaders guidance into le and how to lead us effectively, but also uh, help us with our um, health and that we would not uh, see an increase in COVID cases. We give you thanks for those who have recovered from COVID, even those in our own congregation. You've preserved them in your goodness and mercy, and so we ask, Lord, that you would do that for our entire community. And Lord, we pray that as we hear the discussion of vaccines and there's a myriad of opinions and medicines uh, that are being tried out, Lord, I pray for success in those ventures. I pray that there will be much fruit that comes from the hands of the physicians and experts who are working diligently on this. Lord, we pray for our country. Would you help us and would you help our rulers? And would you help our newly elected rulers who begin in a month's time to lead according to your will, according to your revealed will, your law? Surround them with people who love your law and who love our country. And Lord, we pray for our continuing worship and our service. Lord, help us. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see the truth of your word. And Lord, bless our installation as we approach another year. We give you thanks that we have officers who will be voted on today, but also women officers and the minister, their ministry who will be installed this morning. Lord, bless them. Make this a wonderful year for them. Take them deeper into your love than you've ever taken them before. Cause your face to shine upon all that they do. Help us now, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. I'm going to ask that those who are being installed in the women's ministry stand up. You don't have to come down here because of COVID. There's no sense in you gathering around front. Uh, but you, if you would be, uh, be so kind as to stand, and I will read those names. So for the 2021 year, your women's ministry officers are President Sally Austin, Lord be with us, Vi I don't know if you've noticed, I give Sally a hard time every time I get a chance. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. Uh, I should have, uh, there's no senior citizen discount with me though, so... Um, but no, President Sally Austin, Vice President Kim Leard, Secretary Kat Lavender, Treasurer Becky Sanders, uh, the Circle Chairman are Trisha Lavender, Gina King, and also Sherry Parker? No, not Sherry Parker. Trisha Lavender and Gina King, Missions Chairman Angela Lavender, Historian Jane Gwynn, and Christian Growth, Sherry Parker. Wonderful. Uh, I encourage you uh, to get with these uh, women throughout this year to be involved in all that they're doing. Uh, they have a great responsibility in our church. And because it bears a great responsibility, let me now give them a charge for this upcoming 2021 year and also uh, pray for them and their work. Your charge this morning comes from Romans 16. Let me read to you a couple of verses, Romans 16. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Sancria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. My charge this morning is twofold, first to the congregation and, to, and secondly to our women officers, first to the congregation. I am charging all of us, myself included, to treat these women as Paul treated Phoebe and as his church treated Phoebe. And how did they do that? Well, we just read that they received her in the Lord 
or ask the Lord in a manner that's worthy of all the saints because of their dil- her diligent help in helping Paul spread the gospel and helping Paul deliver the letters. So we as a congregation need to receive these women and to support their work. Uh, look at what Paul says, help her in whatever matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many and to myself as well. These women are a great help to all of us, especially me. They keep me in line often, um, but they help us in a lot of ways uh, that people don't know about, and a lot of their work goes unthanked and unnoticed. So my encouragement and charge to the congregation is to do exactly what Paul wanted done to Phoebe to help them in whatever they need, to support their work, and to receive her in the Lord. Secondly, my charge goes to uh, the women, and it's I want to encourage you to be like Phoebe. Work as one who is worthy to be received in the Lord. Uh, Work even when it's difficult, but also pursue Christ more than anything. It's easy to get busy. It's easy to get bogged down. It's easy to have distractions and stresses. But my friends, you have been chosen by the Lord to serve in the congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ in the women's ministry. And Phoebe was the same. She helped Paul deliver the message. Help me. She helped the congregation in Rome. Help us. We need it. The church has never survived without strong women helping the church out. That's a fact, and that's in Scripture all through the book. So be Phoebe's to us. Let me pray for you. You can be seated, and I'll pray for you. As we know, Sally had a knee replacement, so I don't want to make her stand up any longer than she has to. Let's pray now. Our Lord and our God, we thank you that you have given us such a sound women's ministry. These women have been installed as our officers, and you've done that by your sovereign hand. It is you who placed them there. It's you who have called them to this work, and it's you who will sustain them. And so we ask, Lord, that you would do that, that this year in women's ministry would be the best that they've ever had, that the officers who would serve you would receive their due reward, that you would reward them for their efforts, but that you would also bless them and draw near to them, sanctifying them. But Lord, I ask you that you would also call other women in our church who perhaps are not involved with the women's ministry. Lord, would you open their hearts and show them how valuable it is and how beneficial it is. Would you use the women's ministry as a means of growth, both spiritually and numerically in our church? Would you bless them as they seek to serve you honestly, faithfully, and truly. Lord, we pray as we come now to your scriptures that you would help us to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest your word. For Jesus' sake I pray, amen. Thank you for that. And thank you to our women's ministry. I mentioned when I first got here uh, that I was blown away and encouraged by the strength of our women's ministry. And uh, a year and a few weeks later, I'm even more encouraged and blown away by our women's ministry. You're a blessing to me. Thank you for that. Well, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1, page 44, if you're using the Pew Bibles, Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 67, and we'll read all the way down to... Verse 80, this is the second hymn out of four that we're going to look at, the second hymn of Luke's gospel. Hear God's word, verse 67, And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David his servant. And he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy toward our fathers. And to remember his holy covenant. 
the oath which he swore to Abraham our father, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to pre prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Amen. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of our God remains forever. Well, as I mentioned, this is the second hymn of Luke's gospel that surrounds the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ that we're going to be looking at. Um, and this is a well-known story as well, Zacharias and the birth of John the Baptist. Let me re uh, review quickly the context in which we look. Uh, there was a, uh, a prophecy, if you will, that John that Elizabeth would, bear, uh, would give birth to a son. And what's interesting is, uh, as it happens often in Scripture, this woman, her womb was closed. She was older in age. It was unlikely that she was going to have a child. And yet the Lord performed a miraculous uh, event with her in bringing about John the Baptist. Notice, uh, when this prophecy was um, set forth, there was a lot of doubt. Zacharias doubted. In fact, if you look at uh, verse 20, And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Zacharias had much doubt. He doubted what the Lord will do, as many of us often do as well. We doubt what the Lord will do for us, with us, through us. We doubt what He's promised to do. And in this case, to show His power, God has caused Zacharias to be mute, unable to speak. And then when the time comes, Elizabeth is told to name her son John, but that was not uh, the normal uh, way of doing things back then. Uh, he should have been named, culturally speaking, Zacharias. You always named after the father, and it would go down. And eventually there does have to be a break, and uh, somebody has a different name. But what they would do, there'd be Zacharias the first, second, third, fourth, as we now have juniors and seniors and third generation and so on. But it was a custom to do that. And notice when she says that he'll be named John, the family interjects and says, well, that's a really silly idea. That's not a good name. Look what they say, uh, verse 61. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by that name. Why would you do that? Why are you calling him John? That doesn't make any sense. I don't know about you, uh, but it seems like perhaps her in-laws uh, thought that they had better ideas than she did about uh, what the baby's name should be. And then a miraculous thing happened that caused them to fear the Lord. When they motioned to Zacharias, he was able to speak, and he said he will be called John. The name John means God is merciful. And this whole hymn is really a portrayal of God's mercy. It shows God's mercy to his people. Names are important. And often in Scripture, we miss out on a lot of key things uh, that are going on or that God wants to speak to us because we don't know the names. But in the Scriptures, almost every name, perhaps every name, means something. And there's always key details, if you know what their names mean, to tell you what the rest of the story is going to be like. Or it tells you some redemptive fact about their name or about their story. Names are important. And we do the same thing here, right? When, when somebody's getting ready to have a baby, they, somebody buys them a baby book, and they go, and they flip, and they say, what does this name mean? And they pick a name that means something. But when we see those people, it often, you know, after the first couple of weeks, it 
kind of loses that, and we just know them as John. But we don't think when somebody's named John, we don't automatically think that God is merciful. We're missing out on something there. And so John's name means God is merciful. Zacharias actually means God remembers. And Elizabeth means God is faithful. Elizabeth, your name means God is faithful. And so what do we see here? God remembers, God is faithful, and they're giving birth to God is merciful. What is God doing here? He's setting forth the redemptive plan, the redemptive arc of his salvation. And so this hymn is actually going to bring about those themes and actually use those words to tell the story of God and his great work. Now, I love names. I love unique names. I like to see what names mean. Uh, my name means leader. No jokes, please. My name actually means leader. Uh, one book says leader of the people. Another one says uh, something about the head of a tribe. All right, I kind of like that one. Uh, but my name means leader. And I looked up a couple more names of uh, people in our church. Um, Everett, all right, and I looked at three different books for this. Everett means wild boar. <laughs> wild boar. Mark, who's not here, Mark means warlock. Warlock. W-A-R. That was that Georgia accent. I'm sorry. Warlock. Um, you can make all the jokes you want about that. Um, so Mark Everett, right, who's also not here, um, a warlock wild boar. Uh, Jenna, which is my wife's actual first name, means fair spirit. Very accurate there. Fair spirit. So names mean something, and I, I say that because, it's yes, it's comical, uh, but what I said earlier is true. Now that you know what these names mean in the story, look at what Zechariah's hymn does. Let's look at it now together. Verse 67, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Now notice, he's actually singing. This is a hymn, but he's filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a prophetic song. What God, what Zacharias speaks at this moment is the very words of God. It's akin to an Old Testament prophet who was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave a message to God's people. So Zacharias here prophesied in his song, singing, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. If you'll think back to Mary's Magnificat, Okay, or Mary's song, or her anthem, if you will. How does she start off? Mary starts off thinking about, and this is not wrong what she did, but she starts off blessing the Lord for what God had done in her life. And then as the hymn goes on, it expands out. It expands out a little further to God's people. But it begins with her. Zacharias almost does the exact opposite. He begins by blessing the Lord, in a great way for what God has done universally for his people and what he's accomplished for his people. And by the time he gets to the end of the hymn, he goes through his own blessing of John and then to Jesus. And so as Mary began with what God had done with her and uh, her bearing the Christ and expanded out, Zacharias begins, expanded out, and comes and brings it back into focus. And so it, it goes without saying, but as Mary... When she started off small, she was showing you that this child that I'm blessing the Lord for is going to have universal expansion, universal rule and reign, and universal benefits for God's people. Zacharias is saying, this universal redemption has been accomplished, and it's come, and it's going to be seen more clearly through John and then Jesus. But notice here, notice here what Zacharias says. Look at that. He says, For he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us. He has done this. Jesus wasn't even born yet, but Zacharias is using the past tense. All right, I'm going to teach you a little Greek lesson. All right? That's called the aorist tense. All right? The aorist tense, meaning it's a completed act that's already happened. Zacharias is actually speaking forth and saying, 
It's as if, as if he's so confident in what God's going to do, he can speak about it as if it's already happened. God has visited us. He has accomplished redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation. He has done these things. God is so grand and so powerful and so committed to his purpose that you can actually shout and sing as if something has already happened, even though perhaps you're still waiting for it to happen. My friends, think about this. Zacharias, as I pointed out earlier from verse 20, was somebody who was filled with doubt about what God was about to do. He was filled with doubt about God's fulfilling his promises. And so God made him mute. And now the doubtful, the one who was mute, the one who did not believe, is the one singing, not that God will do this, but that God has done this. There is a word for us in there, friends. There are many of us in here who struggle and who doubt God's promises, who struggle to believe, who are in the advent, if you will, the waiting period of God to fulfill his promises, and we get tired, and it's hard to sing, and it's hard to proclaim. But take a lesson from Zacharias here, who means God remembers, and sing the truths of God as if he's already accomplished it for you. Because in Christ, he has seeing as if it's already done. Next, look at verse 69 where he says, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us. This idea of a horn of salvation is found uh, a lot in the Old Testament. Okay, The horns, uh, it actually symbolizes uh, from an ox who would have horns and who would uh, defeat his enemies, perhaps a lion or something else, by goring with his horns. It was by his horns that salvation was coming. He was being attacked by the enemy, and he used his horns to bring about salvation for him or his, uh, his family. And so uh, Luke here is saying that God has raised up a horn of salvation. He has raised up one who will defeat uh, the enemy. In fact, that's what you uh, see as you go down to verse 72, to show mercy towards our fathers, I'm sorry, 71, salvation from our enemies, verse 71. And from the hand of all who hate us, Luke is shouting and saying that this one who's coming, the horn of salvation that comes from the line of David, he will defend against our enemies. He will defend us. He will bring about salvation. You see this also in Psalm, you see that in Psalm 74 and 75, that idea of the horn of salvation. But also you see in the Old Testament that when it speaks about the horns of salvation, it's also talking about God himself, 2 Samuel 22, verse 3. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. Psalm 18, verses 1 and 2. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So here he is saying that there is one coming, the horn of salvation, who will defeat their enemies. There's universal implications here. Because Israel lived and, uh, and worked under the Roman authorities. There was always conflict. They were always looking for a political savior. You see that when Jesus actually hits the scene. They shout out, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they think that he's coming to overthrow the Roman Empire to set up Israel once again as a theocracy. That's what their expectations of Jesus. And here he's saying that this is happening, that there will be an overthrow, that there will be one who defeats the enemies and reigns forever. Now, he does that, but he does it in a way, as we'll see, he does it in a way, well, that would be difficult for them to understand at the time. 
Let's keep going here, and then we'll get to that. Uh, uh, 70, he, and he has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy towards our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Look what you see there. You have mercy, and you have God remembering his covenant. And the fact that he's showing mercy and remembering his covenant shows his covenant faithfulness. So you see Elizabeth, John, and Zacharias even in this hymn. Those names are pointing you towards something that uh, is happening. That he's coming to be faithful and to remember his covenant. We talk about the covenant all the time. We hearken back to the Old Testament covenant all the time. Because that's exactly what the New Testament does. It hearkens back to that. He mentions David, one that would come. From the line of David, he mentions uh, David early on in verse 69. And now he's saying, showing uh, our covenant uh, faithfulness to our fathers to remember his holy covenant. Verse 73, the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father. Zechariah is saying, here is the one coming who's going to fulfill all things. How does God remember his covenant? How does God keep his promises? He does it in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul can later on say that all the promises of God find their yea and amen in him. Zacharias is saying God has remembered us. He's not forgotten. Yes, we're under Roman oppression. Yes, things are difficult. Yes, we're unhappy. Yes, God made these promises, but he's doing it. And he's doing it through the one who's coming. Through the Lord Jesus. Both of these hymns... In fact, all these hymns point directly to the great work of Jesus. And notice here what Zacharias is saying. The horn of salvation, which I've already mentioned, can often mean God himself. And you saw that in Psalms and in 2 Samuel. Notice he's saying this horn of salvation, who's going to save us from all our enemies, who's he singing about? He's singing about the one who's, who Mary is carrying. It would have been inexplicable, it would have been unthinkable, and it actually was considered uh, blasphemy to think that God himself would come in human flesh. That Mary would give birth to a child who was both God and man. That was unthinkable. And yet that's exactly what Zacharias is saying. There's one coming, the one who Mary is carrying, and he is the horn of salvation. He is God with us. He is God our strength. He is the one who will fulfill all the covenant promises. You would think, you would think if you're Zacharias, and a miraculous thing had just happened, your wife, who's in old age, is going to give birth to a child... And it's an important child. He's one who's going to prepare the way of the Lord. You would think, if that's you, you'd be singing about who? Your son. You think you'd be singing about John. You think the purpose of his hymn would be to talk about John. And John was great. Remember what Jesus said about John the Baptist? That no one born of a woman was greater than John the Baptist. Now, Jesus said that. He said nobody's better than John. So Zacharias here has every right to sing about the miraculous birth of his upcoming son. We would all do the same thing. But look at the humility and the focus of this hymn. We talked last week about how Mary's uh, hymn was God-centered, God-focused. This, my friends, is the same way. His song is God-focused. He's not even gotten to John yet. He's talking about Jesus this whole time. He's proclaiming the, uh, the God of the Scriptures. He's proclaiming Christ, the Savior. He's proclaiming Jesus, the Christ child. He's proclaiming Him, even though John was to be great. In fact, if you were to skip down now to verse 76, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare His ways, to give His people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. Once he finally gets to John, look at how he already notices John's place. To prepare 
a way for the Lord, to go before, to warn and to teach the people about the forgiveness that's coming. He's, uh, John's purpose was to prepare and point to the one who is greater than everyone coming after him. And Zacharias even knows this. My friends, that's a very godly parent. That's a very godly parent. He is committing his child to the service of the Lord. He's being faithful. He circumcised him just as he was told to do. He prophesied about him. He consecrated him, set him aside. Parents, you would all do well to take a lesson from Zacharias and to be faithful and to set aside your child for the service of the Lord, whatever that may look like. It may not be in ministry, but it may. It may be some other way that they serve the Lord. But before John was even born, Zacharias was preparing himself and preparing John to be the one who would come before. This hymn teaches us that God is fulfilling his covenants, that he's doing it through Jesus Christ, that John is preparing the way of the Lord. But look at what this fulfillment of these covenant promises bring us. Knowledge of salvation, forgiveness of sins, because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us. Zacharias is singing about salvation. He's singing about the tender mercies of our God. He's singing about what brings it about. Now, that's great. And we talk about that a lot, don't we? We talk about God and his fulfilling his purposes and bringing about salvation for his people. But what do you think the purpose of that is? We've mentioned before that it's because God is great. He says that exactly in the Exodus. I'm bringing you out of the land of Egypt, the land of slavery, because of my holy name. He says it all through the Psalms. I'm doing this because I'm great. But notice here, if you were to back up, we see the purpose of our redemption. Zacharias has told us redemption is coming. He's told us who it's coming through. He told us what the effects that it's going to have corporately. But there's also effects here for each individual. Look at this in verse 74. To grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. Why did God come? Why did Jesus come? Why did he come to set the captives free? Why did he come to do that? Why did he come to rescue us from our sins? So that we would worship him. That we would be holy and righteous. That we would be holy as the Lord is holy. That we would walk before him all of our days. Exodus 7, verse 16. They shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness that they may serve me. God sets you free for service. He sets you free for worship. He sets you free so that you would come into relationship with Him, that you would grow in communion with Him, that you would fall more in love with Him, that you would serve Him with more zeal. God didn't set you free in order for you to live as if you're still in bondage to sin. Since we're speaking about the Exodus, it would be the equivalent of God saving His people from Egypt. They're being freed. They make it across the sea. They turn around and they go, I'm glad we're free. Let's go back. Oh, you know what? They actually did say that, didn't they? In the wilderness. Would that we have died in Egypt. My friends, God set them free so that they would be a people completely consecrated to Him. God set each and every one of us free so that we would worship Him in obedience and truth and holiness and righteousness. If you don't care 
about obedience to the Lord, it may be a sign that you have not been truly set free, that you don't know exactly what God has saved you from. It's as Peter tells us. Peter, speaking on the same point, says that those who, who, uh, who live as if God has not set them free, who live as if they're still in bondage to sin, Peter says they're so nearsighted because they had forgotten the Lord who saved them. So Zacharias here is shouting out God's redemption, that it's not just corporately, but it's so that we would serve him. How does he do this? How does Jesus actually fulfill the covenant promises? How does he actually redeem his people? How does he actually overthrow God's enemies? How does he actually reverse everything that's gone wrong? How does he actually do all that? Well, look at what he says here. We already noticed that he was the horn of salvation but notice he says, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Jesus is bringing us peace. He's making God's face to shine upon us. But how does he do this? My friends, he does this. He makes God's face to shine upon us because God turned his face away on him. You see, the one who was the horn of salvation, who had the horns of, on his head, well, really, in Jesus' picture, it was a crown of thorns. You see, in Genesis 22, verse 22, the sacrifice of Isaac, or Isaac is offered up in Genesis chapter 22 by Abraham. And he says here in verse 13, actually, let's back up to verse 12. He says, he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then verse 13, then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. The ram was caught in the thicket by his horns. My friends, the Lord Jesus Christ, the horn of salvation, who had the crown of thorns placed on his head, who was caught in the thicket of God's wrath, has fulfilled that sacrifice for us. That's not at all what people expected. People expected a great political overthrow and a great political king. That's not what they got. Powers were most certainly overthrown, but they were overthrown by a mighty conqueror who actually laid down his life, who offered himself up as a horn caught, as a ram caught in the thickets. After this service, I'm going to read the Aaronic benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. My friends, that's what you get today. But that's not what Jesus got. The horn of salvation because of the tender mercy of God. The sunrise from on high who will visit us who will shine upon those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. The one who brings that about got the exact opposite of that for us. The Lord did not bless him and keep him. The Lord did not make his face to shine upon him. The Lord did not, was not gracious. He didn't lift up his countenance and he didn't give him peace. On the cross, Jesus got the exact opposite. When we read these hymns, and when we celebrate Advent and we speak of the Lord coming to save us, let us not forget that Jesus, yes, he was born, but he was born to die. Jesus was born to die. That was his purpose. There's a great song by the 
I think they're two friends named Shane and Shane. Some of y'all probably listen to Shane and Shane's music. They're, they're very talented, and they have a song called Born to Die, and they say, When the babe was born in a manger on the hay, God saw a veil torn. He saw Good Friday. He was born to die. How did Jesus come and fulfill what Zacharias was prophesying and singing about? Because he, he came and he did that by being born to die. born to die. That's what his advent served. That's why he did it. Without that, we don't get anything else. We don't get peace. So my friends, let me ask you, do you have peace this morning? Really? Do you have peace? Jesus came to bring us peace. Do you have it? Jesus came to bring us into communion with the Lord to cause his face to shine upon us. Do you have it? Do you have that communion with the Lord? Jesus offers that to you this morning. He offers you peace, not only that gets you through whatever trials and tribulations you're going through, but he offers you peace with God himself. You get vertical peace and horizontal peace. You get peace with God and peace with life. That's what's offered to you this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your peace. We thank you for your accomplishment of our redemption that we can actually sing as if it's already happened because it has happened. Jesus has come to set us free. But Lord, we often do not live that way. I pray that you would use your word to point us to the way of peace, to help us. I pray, Lord, that sincerely, that by power of Holy Spirit, everyone in here heard a much better sermon than the one that was actually preached. Lord, be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand and sing in response to God's word. Hymn number 311, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, 311.
hymn, friends, God has brought us peace. Zacharias' hymn is often called the Benedictus, which means the benediction or a good word. So receive your good word from the Lord this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. Amen. Amen. 